All right, guys, the red light's on. So this is the recording time. We did it. We got to this point. This was this is a, a big step for us. Why don't you do me a quick favor? One, introduce yourself, since there's two of you uh, for our listeners, and then tell us what you had for breakfast this morning. <laughs> yeah, so uh, hi, I'm, I'm Simon. Um, I'm working with Philip on this uh, new company, which is uh, one of the few companies who produce cast iron skillets in, in Germany. And we uh, just recently launched our Kickstarter campaign. Um, yeah, we were at the moment, like we were, we were very surprised with the, how many people supported us, but I think that's, Philip is gonna tell you a bit more about that. Yeah, breakfast. Ah, yeah, yeah my breakfast. for breakfast. Uh, well, breakfast, yeah. That's what everybody wants uh, to know. Honestly, like, I think it was just a banana. It was a bit rushed this morning, so. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Philip, much. how about yourself there? But, uh, as we are from, from Bavaria, um, we had some uh, sausages for, so typical sausages for for lunch. So that we made up for that, I guess. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Awesome. Um, my name is Philip. Uh, thanks for having us. I'm the founder of Stur together with Simon. And I developed the product. I started developing it last year. And yeah, I had actually a pretzel for breakfast. A pretzel? A German pretzel, yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> We're only holding up the flag here. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, uh, I mean, you guys kind of talked about it, but for our listeners who you know haven't checked out the project, don't know really what we're talking about yet, why don't you guys do me a favor and kind of explain the skillet, the name, what it does, and and you know why you're over on Kickstarter right now? Sure. Yeah. So you wanna, I think you. Well, the name definitely comes from your your uh, came from you. So yeah, I'll start. Um, so everything began when Simon and I met during our studies in a little town in Germany. We both studied e-commerce and during our studies, we founded our, a couple of blogs and one of them stuck out and grew bigger than all the other ones. And it was about frying pans and skillets. So okay. very specific. And yeah. this is how we eventually came up to create our own skillet now last year and now just uh, started our crowdfunding campaign. So we're both very enthusiastic cooks and Simon actually is a trained cook by now. He went to cooking school, a famous cooking school in Paris, France. And yeah, we started with a blog and started recommending all kinds of skillets, testing, reviewing them and, and recommending them to people, answering questions. And um, after a while, we, we came up with the idea, why not? Because people str were struggling with iron pans. We were recommending, I mean, cast iron skillets or cast iron pans in the US are pretty big. In Germany, they exist, but they're not as popular, I would say. And, um, but they're really good. And uh, we, we were recommending them to people and they were struggling with using them, like seasoning. I know, I don't know if you're uh, really into cooking, but- Yeah, I got a little bit, you know, I can, I, can, uh, <laughs> I can do some damage in the kitchen if I need to, but uh, you know, so. Yeah, people, people were struggling a little bit with it and we were helping them. And after a while we recognized, hey, why, why don't we create our own brand, our own skillet, which is optimized for beginners. So the whole idea behind store, our brand, is to create a cast iron skillet that's perfect for, yeah, people who didn't have never cooked with cast iron skillets. And a lot of cast iron enthusiasts also enjoy it because the design is great. And yeah, it's completely made in Germany and all of that. That's yeah, cool. we, we, yeah, go ahead. Say, what, what, go, what goes into like, I guess, you know, I've never made a skillet. I've never thought about making my own skillet. I just go to the store and buy one or whatever, you know, so like, how do you guys start that process of what are you looking for to uh, to make better than what's out there? Like, what, what are you guys like? What what in your mind is saying? Hey, we need to hit these three or four things that make our skillet special. Sure. So I think some something which we approached a bit differently was that from the beginning beginning on, we took the community into the development process. Mm -hmm. So every time there was a, a decision to be made, for example, about the handle um, design, we sent out a survey, we had like, a, up, up until now, it's roughly 20,000 people who were on the newsletter, who were in the community, and kind of voted on these important design decisions. And um, Philip actually found these great product designers here in Berlin who, who we 
we're working with, um, which also helps us a lot in developing the product. But I guess one thing which was really um, critical was also to find a manufacturer here because that's most of the casting by now is, has moved to China or to Eastern Europe. There's not that many foundries left in, in Germany because of production costs, because of uh, cost of um, for, uh, for, for salaries. So it was hard to find a company which takes us on as a client, but also can produce a skillet the quality quality wise as good as we wanted. Right. And yeah, Philip uh, actually found this, this uh, foundry, which is super has been founded when exactly? Oh, in eighteen hundred something. So they've been they've been. Uh, so they know the what they're doing, part. right? They they yeah, they figured yeah. it out, right? <laughs> yeah. But they've been more recently they've been producing um, parts for German premium car brands. They 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 don't know much about cookware, or actually they have um, cast skillets up until the 1970s, but uh, then they quit, and now we're kind of reviving that business. Yeah. Okay. They actually they actually produced the first engine for the Bugatti racing cars. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's not everybody's story. So, no. you know, so for you guys, I mean, now that you're kind of, you've, you know, you understand what you want to make and you're, you're, you're finding the people around to help, you know, what starts the process? Is it, you know, prototyping one out of cardboard at first just to like, Hey, it feels right. Is it making them where they don't work? Like how many prototypes do you kind of go through before you feel like you get to something that is what you wanted it to be? So because we were, um, in the business of, of frying pans and reviewing them. And we knew a lot of uh, about the topic. We had very a, a very specific um, idea of what the skillet will look like. Because, I mean, it's, it's, it's a skillet. So the basic design, we from, from years of using and reviewing skillets, we knew what we wanted, basically. So the process was finding, like Simon said, the designers we worked with and giving them our basic idea like the yeah the, the what, what we wanted to have in the skillet and let them um create a couple of drafts a couple of details for let's say the handle design but we knew how how steep we wanted the walls to be and mm -hmm. and stuff like that and what we did so i think that's most relevant for listeners is we um worked with our community so Every time we, like Simon said, we had a big design a design decision to make. We didn't just do it on our own, but we um, we sent out a survey and sent people photos of of the, the handle designs the designers created. And we said, "Hey, look, we we're we're in front of that decision. What would you choose?" And then people voted, and they felt very included in the project. Like they were also, it wasn't us developing the product; it was them as well. So, and I, I think that's that's the main driver of our um, success so far. But so, to come back to your question, um, we started with three D modeling, uh, hmm. a bunch of different designs. We took those design decisions, then we um, printed out a three D prototype made out of plastic or some, something similar yeah. and then we actually uh, cast it into yeah we, ma we made it out of iron so we could actually test it and cook with it and after that we had to do a bunch of um, adjustments and by now we yeah we've we've done several rounds of prototypes before we even started the crowdfunding campaign that's great what what during that process um are the things that you're looking for again as you're going through this process and you're 3D printing and you're maybe you know cooking with it and actually using it? What are you sort of looking for of like this works, this doesn't work? You know, mm -hmm. was there something really specific in your mind that you were going for? Yeah, well, I guess like one of the most important things was that it was nice that the product had a nice hand feel. Mm -hmm. So like you want to, it had to be something you want to pick up daily, which shouldn't be too heavy, but have enough weight to cook your. Um, steak, your fish, your vegetables, whatever, right. properly. So you have to have some kind of uh, mass. And also, as we always come back to the handle because I think that's the thing you you have the most uh, contact with when you're when you're cooking with a skillet. Right. And really need to be need to be perfect. And um, yeah, we're like this is actually like the finishing of that. This is something 
um, which takes a lot of time. Like it's the small details in the end, which add up to the to the whole product, which you don't even see. Like there were so many steps on the way where we thought, like, okay, we're just gonna. That's it's just a skillet in the end. But on the other side, there's always something new coming up, and you're like, okay, how can we solve that now? How can we solve this problem? But yeah, somehow you make it, and uh, yeah, I guess that's. Yeah, everyday usability. This is something we we want to achieve with the skillet. So maybe maybe I can add something uh, to yeah. that. Um, when, when we started, we we looked at the pain points people have. So um, people were complaining about the the weight of cast iron skillets that it's right. that they're super heavy and uh, things like that. And we were looking into how how we could solve these problems. Like we were looking at how how should the skillet look if we want to convince beginners to actually use it. And people were struggling with the seasoning process because um, usually, at least when you buy a carbon steel skillet, it, it's a, it's a similar um, type of skillet. You have to season it at home, and that's what what is sold mostly in Germany, like these carbon steel mm-hmm. skillets. Mm-hmm. And we said, okay, we want to reduce the weight. We want to offer it seasoned um, in the factory. So when you receive it, you can start using it right away and things like that. So we, we the whole design is based on user feedback and the pain points users had. That's cool. That's interesting. Um, you know, I guess through this process, um, how are you walking the fine line of being as open as you're describing, right? Like being this sort of community-driven you know, hey, we're taking advice from everybody while still holding on to, yeah, but I want it to be this, you know? I mean, like, I'm assuming you had to have gotten a couple of things where you're like, yeah, we're not doing that, but thank you, you know? So, but I, I always find that that's a, that's a fine line to walk for for designers, companies, crowdfunding, you know, doing crowdfunding in general. Of how do you stay your course of what you want it to be while still being open of taking that feedback? How did you guys walk that line? Well, I guess like with the surveys, because it was kind of the majority vote, it was a bit easier. What and I think I got the we got the advice from from Jamie Segmeyer, um, like from his blog, where he said like if somebody has a suggestion, ask him how he would do it. And a lot of people notice by just get, trying to answer this question by themselves that doesn't isn't really feasible to to add this feature or right. whatever. I mean, there's a lot of cons- constraints, especially like with this product, we're on the edge of how you can produce cast iron because it's the walls are quite thin the machining is super hard to make and um so a lot of the constraints actually come from the production side as well so uh, that's one one of the constraints and on the other hand i think most of the decisions they were the majority of decisions they were not really something where we would say like we would have said like yeah this is not we would never do this right Sometimes people have really crazy ideas and you just have to tell them, yeah, we might do that in the future, but right now this is our first product. We, we can't really do like a huge skillet because a bunch of people might be interested, but it's not for the, for the majority of people. Right, right, right. And, and you guys mentioned this too a minute ago, and I think this is something that's important for project creators getting ready to you know, potentially launch their own or even just get into the startup world. You mentioned that you were really focused on maybe the average cook person, right? Like you, mm-hmm. you, you wanted everybody to be able to use this. It, it, is there a major difference between like a professional grade skillet that like, uh, you know, like a, a chef working 12 hour days would be using compared to this? Or did you guys just want to say, no, our, our skillet can be used in both these, um, you know, these examples, but we really want to focus on, you know, the everyday user because we think that that's a better audience than, than maybe like a B2B strategy, right? Like we're just going to go after the high end chefs. Like, um, but in your design process, are you still making something that, a high-end chef could still use all day at a restaurant or something like that. Does that make sense? Well, I, I guess I can answer that from the, from my working experience in restaurants. And like, at least in Europe, you don't really see cast iron in the mm. uh, in the restaurants. I guess okay. in the US, it's the same thing. They use carbon steel, but not really cast iron because it's quite heavy as well. Right. Um, so in a professional environment, like we haven't really... There were some. We talked to some chefs, and they really liked the idea. We haven't really tried it in a um, professional environment. It also depends on the restaurants. There's some right. restaurants where pans get thrown around. There's the, <laughs> right. uh, the the sink where they they just drop it for the dishwasher. Yeah, right. um, like for example, in the restaurant I've worked in Paris, I don't think it would have been the place for for a skillet like this. Yeah. Um, 
because they were going through skillets like like uh, underwear, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's I worked in nice. restaurants for my whole life too. That's why I keep picturing. I was like, yeah, this thing yeah. being thrown to the dishwasher. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I don't see so, that in my mind right now. So yeah. So I guess for the moment, like we should, we should we'll give it to some chefs for sure, and if it holds up uh, to the daily abuse of professional kitchens, uh, why not? Um, but for the moment, I'd say we we're really focusing on, on B2C, on, on end consumers. And um, yeah, that's also what we, des- we, we designed it also in a way that it could be a standalone piece to show in your, in your kitchen, that it works. Right. Like, that's also why we drifted a bit away from the classical cast iron look, because we wanted it to be, look perfectly in a stylish Manhattan apartment, as well as on a farm in, in uh, in the mountains in Bavaria for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. How how long was the process from the idea of this to where we are right now? What's the time frame? Um longer than I thought in the beginning. <laughs> so I started so we had this idea in 2018, but until we started it was about February last year, so February okay. 2019. And um, until now, which is November, I'd say, yeah, one and a half years. Okay. Dur- during that time, what was the thing that was maybe keeping both of you guys up at night? Like, what was the thing that you were like, man, we really got to make sure we nailed this? <laughs> Interesting question. I think um, what, what we did, we, we really want to create a perfect product. So I think we promised people a lot of things and to to actually keep up with that and, and deliver it. I think from time to time, we we were not so sure. That's why the process also took that long because we, we wanted, to, before we started crowdfunding, we wanted to make sure, okay, we, we can actually deliver on our promise. And mm-hmm. we we w- wouldn't have started the c- crowdfunding campaign if we weren't sure we, we actually can deliver. So yeah, what yeah. was your experience? Yeah, I guess like this, this really kept us up at, at night, like, trying to really deliver what we promised on because there have been, we've seen so many Kickstarters where people over promise, over market their right. product. And um, we did everything in our, yeah, what we could do before the Kickstarter campaign to, to see if the processes work out, if, um, if the, the, uh, the, the cost for production is the cost we're looking at, the real cost we're looking at at the end. Um, to be as safe as possible that we can really deliver the product. Right. It's, it's as, as we said, like um, as this kind of cast iron steel is on the edge of being producible due to the thinness of the walls and some other, some other technical details. Um, there was not only one thing, but I think there were several, several yeah. things. The seasoning, for example, like just trying to find somebody who could do it on a scale like what we uh, was super hard and uh, yeah, but we're, we're super confident now that we can deliver on what we promise. And I think now we can sleep pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Where, where in this journey of, you know, that one and a half, two years, this, that the idea of kickstart running the Kickstarter starts to come into your mind of saying, okay, we, you know, we've, we 3d printed, we've done all this stuff. We're getting feedback from the crowd. When did you guys go? Like, we want to make sure that we're launching this on Kickstarter. Um, this was pretty clear from the beginning. Like we, we first wanted to verify that there's actually demand for it. But from the beginning, my plan or our plan was to eventually launch a crowdfunding campaign when, we're, when we have the product ready to, to be produced or closed before that. And that's where we are right now. So but we've, the whole journey we went th- through was um, with Kickstarter in mind. So we built this community actually to do it with the way we did it. So we wanted to develop the product with, with our, our fans and actually let them be a part of it and uh, yeah, sell it through crowdfunding. Gotcha. Gotcha. What, what were you hoping, um, you know, as you're going through this journey, then you're thinking that, Hey, I'm going to run a Kickstarter. What are you, and the product's now coming together. How are you putting the content and the copy together for this page and the video, like, because the page does, it looks great. It tells a story, you know, um, and I think it could be challenging because, and this is a no offense, 
it's an everyday item for a lot of people, right? It's a cooking item. So how do you start to make people feel like, hey, this is this is the you know really great product that should be in your in your in your kitchen. You you, you should be using this thing every day. How do you start to think? What do we need story wise, content wise, to go on this page to ultimately then sell the product, right? You know, uh, at the end of the day. Um. So in the beginning, we showed a lot of content around the, the production and the designing part, and it, it didn't look as clean and, and sexy as it does right now. So right. The content you see now on our Kickstarter campaign page was produced recently, I would say. Like when, when we had the first prototypes, it, it took us until like two months ago until we had the prototype ready that we wanted to shoot photos with because before that, it, it, it wasn't that beautiful. and. <laughs> right. We didn't want to show it in, in that way. So um, along the whole journey of developing it, we, we showed people the real product and the, the real process, like just photos taken with the iPhone, not not magical at all, right. like just raw, raw, the raw experience. Mm-hmm. And um, right before Kickstarter, we invested a lot in the video production and actually shooting proper photos and all of that. So I would say, yeah, it was a two two um, two ways of doing it. First, very raw, and then yeah, as like, professional as possible. There were a lot of iterations for the campaign page, and I think I put the last touch in it like the evening before we launched. <laughs> um, there were still some mistakes with the with the visuals. But we were in a lucky position that we had like a lot of good friends who were supporting us. Like, for example, my, my girlfriend, she made most of the uh, graphics for the campaign page. Um, a very good friend of us did the video. Um, so we were kind of surrounded by people who already knew about this project and how important it is for us. And right. they uh, took on to the journey. And yeah, so... Helped us bring it to life. We, we basically told the story how it is. and. Um, yeah. How how we how we met our how the product came to life um, where we are now why we need to produce why we what we need the funding for and um, yeah, being I, honest I guess yeah I think that's yeah. like and this goes through the whole campaign like we're active in the com- uh, comment section every day like I'm answering right. uh, every comment uh, email Facebook whatever so we have our own Facebook group we're in contact with people. Um, yeah, so it's. I think that's on Kickstarter. What pays off is being honest with uh, what you're trying to achieve, and yeah, and yeah, even in the maybe for the short term gains, it might pay off to do to to do it more like to over market your product. But in the long term, if you want to build a business out of it, you have to be um, honest about your your goals and what you what you're doing Kickstarter. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. What um was there a metric you were looking for that said you were actually ready to launch? Like, yeah, you know, the page might look all great, you know, you've got the product, but like, was there a data point of saying, hey, we got a thousand emails, 20,000 emails with, you know, we, we've had, um, you know, we had people really say, I'm backing this on day one. Cause again, that's the biggest mistake that we see almost yeah. every campaign make, right? Like, yeah, yeah, they, they did all the stuff you're talking about. Then they launched and there was actually no crowd built. So like, what were you guys looking for to say, no, nope, we're ready. This is, this is, this is the time to do it. Yeah. So I think what we were, um, actually it was not so much about like the number of of email subscribers we had, it was more about um, being able to really deliver the product. Mm. While we were still collecting emails, of course, but that was in our mind that went to the calculations. But in the end, what gave us the green light was that we had the the first, the the, uh, testing, testing, uh, the test production run tested by an institute here in Germany who uh, did various tests on them to see if they are totally safe for um, food contact. Also, they were also tested to FDA standards. And at that point, we were like, okay, if we now we can really get into mass and producing these skillets because otherwise, if we wouldn't have this kind of um, certificate, it would have been a huge um, risk to take. But let's uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about the marketing aspect and the validation aspect as well. So. Um, we have a marketing background and from the beginning on when we right when we started developing the product we made sure that people are interested in buying it so even with the very first prototype that looked very rough and it was actually just a sketch we were starting to ask people hey would you buy this send me the money like we didn't receive any money but we were we were actively asking people for money and in a 
more conservative fashion. Sure. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we, we wanted to really validate if, if people would buy this, if we create this product like we, we now did and, and promised. And because you were asking about the number, um, we didn't have a super specific number in mind, but you, you know average conversion rates and all of that beforehand. Right. So we wanted to make sure, okay, we have a, a certain crowd that will support us on day one. And everyone knows um, that achieving your goal, reaching your goal on the very first day on Kickstarter or other platforms is really important to, yep. to convince other people. So we wanted to make sure that we can achieve that but we, yeah, there wasn't like a number of 50,000 subscribers. Right, right, yeah. That really. That's interesting. Well, I mean, you mentioned it right there. I mean, we talk about that. This is when I'm coaching a lot of clients around, like, well, we kind of can get average conversion rates, uh, your cost per unit, right? So again, if your cost is $100, your cost is $20, mm-hmm. you know, how much is that going to be? You got 1,000 emails, you got 10,000 emails. We can work out some math on that. So, well, let's flip over. I mean, we actually haven't even talked real specifics about this Kickstarter campaign. So, while we're talking right now, you have about nine days to go. Um, when people are hearing this, it'll be the like the last week of the campaign here. Um, your goal is about twenty four grand. I'm in U.S. dollars here, but you're yeah. under just under a million dollars, right? So yeah. it's uh, <laughs> you know, uh, over five thousand backers. So a lot of people clearly are uh, are into the are, are into your skillet, right? Um, what has been the biggest thing that has stood out that you were like? man, I did not expect this. Like everybody <laughs> in the Philippines are buying it or whatever it might be. Has there been something that you just did not expect at all? Um, we didn't expect people for, for people to buy it that quickly. Like yeah. we, we, <laughs> we had to $20,000 or 24, 20,000 yeah. euros, $24,000 in three minutes. And we were at a hundred K in 13 minutes. And then we, <laughs> I mean, it was growing like crazy. We were sitting yeah. here and, and wanted to watch the launch and uh we're just like frozen like <laughs> <laughs> it was ridiculous i mean i mean we knew we have a big email list and that certainly people will buy it but we we didn't expect it to to happen so fast, fast. like yeah. i was i was saying yeah the first the first conversion the first backer is going to come in after four minutes because it takes all the time to read through the campaign page <laughs> Literally one second after it was at four thousand euros. So. Like hundreds of people didn't even watch the video. We put so much effort <laughs> right, in the video right. and, and on the, in, in the campaign page, and they just just bought it, which was an amazing feeling. Like that that means that we did most of the work beforehand yeah. and prepared people for it and made them excited. And I think that's right. yeah. But we didn't expect it to work that well. That's crazy. So what? Now, what is happening right now in the campaign, even though it's kind of rolling down, you know, towards the end, um, what is happening, though, to keep that momentum going, making sure that there was momentum between days five and day, you know, 20? Like, what what was kind of the behind the scenes, the conversations you guys were having as a team and saying, hey, make, hey let's, let's make sure we do this and, you know, let's do this. What did those kind of look like? Yeah. I think that was a bit twofold. It was on one side, it was on the uh, marketing side. So... We were starting our own ads. We were working, working with an agency um, to put up ads. We did a lot of PR outreach. Um, so that was kind of that. Then also answering to a lot of customer um, questions because a lot of actually, since a lot of the people um, who backed our campaign came from Germany and have never backed Kickstarter before, we kind of had to lead them through the whole process yeah. of how, to, how it works and what crowdfunding actually is. So we had a lot of explaining to do. But I think this really paid off. Um, we made like a screencast and um, Philip's sister is also helping us a lot with, with answering these questions. Um, and then on the other hand, we tried because we felt like this was a big deal for a lot of people. And uh, I mean, it's the normal thing with crowdfunding that you don't get the product right after, that it takes some, a while to right. produce. So since we have reached our goal and way, way beyond that, we were we were looking at ways on how to produce faster and how to speed up the process. So we have already invested into new um, tooling, new tooling to make it faster and also communicate that to people back that we're not just like sitting on the money and uh, we're really trying to, to make the stuff like make it faster, make it better. Yeah. Was there, was there any concern um, if your audience was, was mostly coming from, from Germany? Just because, again, I, I run a lot of campaigns. Germany is like fifth or sixth on my list of countries yeah. that typically support campaigns. Was there was there any like you know fear factor in that around like 
you know, hey, we're just going to hit 30K because Germany is going to be our big. How mm-hmm. did you get the US, Canada, I mean, you, you know, all, all these other countries to start participating in your, uh, in your campaign? Yeah. This was actually one of our biggest challenges that we struggled with because there's not many campaigns that, uh, that have run in two languages simultaneously, yeah. like yeah. bilingual. And um, there wasn't much, much of experience that we could rely on or, yeah. So we, we were debating a lot about making the video in English or German, how to do it with subtitles, how to structure the campaign page, whether we should put the English version up or down, like we, we, we have it in right. both languages now with, with English first. And what we finally decided on is um, making the video in German because our, our audience is mostly German and um, the product is made in Germany and we're a proud German company. So we thought right. that, could, that, that should work, that reflects our brand really well. And we just put um, English subtitles on it and hoped for the best, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Like every every experienced crowdfunding marketer um, disagreed with us and yeah. told us to to yeah. use it definitely. I would have had, I would have had a conversation with you like, hey, let's talk about this a little bit more. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Everyone <laughs> recommended us to to go with English and yeah. even other big German campaigns um, have run in in uh, had their video in English, like English yeah. speaking. We felt like okay, hey, it's a risk, but. Let's take I think it. that reflects what we are doing and how we want to present ourselves. Yeah, maybe. yeah. <laughs> maybe. That's great. No, I, I, it was one of the first things that kind of caught my eye. Was like I, I was intrigued. I was like, there had to have been a conversation internally about this because mm-hmm. you don't get yeah. to a campaign of the success you're having. Yeah. You know, without having at least have had that conversation. So yeah. you know, so you know, nine days to go, money drops about two weeks afterwards. Um, what's What's starting to happen? I know you, you're mentioning you're getting t- new tooling or you're speeding up this process, but for you guys as a team, how are you making sure that one quality is still happening? You're still hitting deadlines. You know, you're not just rushing it to rush it, you know, but also how are you then managing? That's a lot of orders. 5,000 mm-hmm. orders is a lot of orders, right? So like, how are you making sure that everything that's coming out is still great? You know, it's, it's, it's up to par and backers are getting it maybe a little early or right on the, t- on the timeline that you set. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, we widened at once. We made sure that every step in the supply chain works out. So we already have um, somebody who's doing the logistics. We have somebody who's going to do the packaging, et cetera, et cetera. So all these steps, we already thought about them. Um, since the manufacturer, and that's also like an important part, the foundry, they, they normally, they used to do high precision parts for, for mainly for car engines. Um, and huge numbers and huge numbers right. as well right. so we, we were made sure that even in this scenario we could offer the quality we promised um, so there's in, in the various steps there's quality control also for uh, some steps we're going to be on, on the premises we're going to check if um, the quality is up to par we're going to do regular checks on the product um, yeah and if something should should not be correctly with, with when it's is delivered of course we're going to um, be very open about it and be yeah. I can exchange it. That's that's something um, we really want to stand for, and yeah. So, so I think we we did everything so far we can to to make sure that the product arrives um, in the right quality. And as you were asking about like the time time frame, yeah, we, we already like now we're in the last phase of actually today. There's some more tests going on in the in the foundry about the finishing of the of the skillet, and um, the moment we say this is like. Now everything is is perfect. Then we hit the button and uh, we start casting casting skills. That's cool. That's cool. Walk walk me through a little bit to shipping and handling because I think this is an interesting product to to ship. Um, and I know she put certain countries on there, so that was you know as somebody who has killed a couple companies with shipping and handling in my time. Um, you know, this is a product that I'm assuming it's a little bit of an odd shape, and there's weight to it, right? Like it's there's just going to be weight and odd shape. So how did you guys handle making sure that shipping and handling doesn't kill your company with a ton of orders, right? Or, you know, or shipping one to some random Island that, you know, costs 500 bucks, you know, like, why am I shipping it to the, you know, how did you guys handle that? So we tried to get like the best estimates you could beforehand. We're not charging in like, that's why also we're charging in after the campaign because with COVID it's actually like, there's some extra fees for shipping it out of Germany. Yeah. We were also in contact with a lot of like U.S. fulfillment centers because, as Philip said in the beginning, we thought uh, the U.S. might be a huge market. 
which at the moment it doesn't look like for, for our um, product, but uh, or for the Kickstarter campaign. But um, so we kind of like went through all the different scenarios. What we're trying to do is like, if there's more, in the end, we're gonna, we're gonna see how many orders we have from the S and what kind of um, shipping mode is the best if we ship over a pallet and then get it from there. But at the moment, we're right. probably gonna ship everything from, from uh, Germany. And packaging wise, we have this, this company who we're working with who does all kinds of tests. So they have like a set of skillets, they already designed the packaging. There's like a, a certain process which they're put through. They they fall from a certain height. Um, you know, they get through all of that without damage. They they can be shipped. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a, that's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just just that little component is a lot of work. You know, yeah, moving yeah. these products across the world here. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Well, well, let's flip over. Let's let's talk about nothing to do with uh, crowdfunding your product or any of that stuff. Let's do a quick little lightning round of some stuff here. So if you, uh, so what are you guys watching on like streaming channels, Netflix, Hulu, what are you guys watching right now to, to unwind? <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Um, I, I don't have too much time at the moment to, to watch many things. So I've been reading more lately, Okay. but the, the most recent thing I watched was, um, the newest BBC documentary with uh, David Attenborough. I forgot the, pla- the, the name. That's, One that's very, very relaxing, I guess. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's down. actually right. also a little bit traumatizing because it's also about, uh, it's mostly about the environment and the issues uh, we face. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But, We're just yeah. burning our burning our home down, but that's all, that's cool. <laughs> Whatever. <right? laughs> what about you? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I at the moment, I'm watching uh, an, an Amazon series called, no, I'm not even sure it's produced by Amazon, but it's on Amazon Prime. So it's called Do- Germany 83, and it's about like the Cold War and the spy okay. from Germany going to Western Germany. And, yeah, it's it's interesting because that was like just before I was born, but it's such an important time for the, right. the whole world. And yeah. We're always on the on the edge of a uh, complete nuclear civilization <laughs> of the world. And, yeah, that was so like getting a feeling for these times is super interesting. What about yeah. you? Do you have any uh, recommendations? Yeah, you know, uh, I'm watching uh, Baskets right now on uh, Hulu. Uh, it's about, uh, um, I think it's Zach, what is that? Uh, the guys that have the beer, Zach uh, Gafranaskis. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, uh, he, yeah, wants yeah, be, he wants to be a clown. Yeah. He just wants to be a clown. It's very I've light. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good unwinding at the moment. Uh, but yeah, that's about it right now for me. Uh, that, that's what we're watching. Uh, so how about for you guys? Uh, so you mentioned reading. Like, what are you reading right now? Any books? What, what, are, the, what are the books? I'm, I'm reading a book Simon recommended to me about <laughs> D2C brands. So actually business. It's called Selling Naked. So it's about um, the founder of... It's written by the founder of Hubble, uh, Contact Lenses, um, direct to consumer brand. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he's... He's telling he's he's writing about how to build up your brand and right yeah, like market it. If you're like looking long term, if you want to build up a brand, that's one of the books uh, I really really like. Also, is like numbers. It's not, not yeah. just like some some business uh, fluff talk, but it's really like how to calculate your customer acquisition costs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right, right, right. Yeah, very new like approaches to that as well. So yeah, yeah, that sounds like a good one. Very, yeah, very sounds good like a real good one. How about um, how about podcasts? You guys listen to anything? I mean, obviously, listen to my podcast. I know that, but like, what are the other ones that you might be listening to? <laughs> well, for me, it's more like if I want to know something about a certain topic, then I listen to to it. But it's, I don't really have the podcast I am listening to. I'm more of a reading guy than a okay. listening podcast because I kind of phase out during listening sometimes. So. <laughs> yeah. There's a good uh, a political podcast in Germany, but it's in German, so yeah. probably not too interesting. And <laughs> um, Tim Ferriss's podcast is yeah, it's is good. One. I really like. Um, yeah, it's, I, it's I used to be podcast. way more into him. Then at some point, when I was like, man, this is like a three-hour episode or something like that. And I was yeah, like, that's I don't know. I'm listening to it from time to time when when I'm in the car and I'm really in the mood. But yeah, Phil was just telling me that he's joking with his girlfriend that Tim Ferriss' morning routine needs takes like six hours or <laughs> yeah, right, right. Just, just a whole. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I bought some books and I read this. I was like, well, that's like my whole day. I just, I just yeah. made shakes all day and cooked a special I guess food. His podcast, and- his, podcast, his podcast is so popular that he does an episode uh, 
one episode per week and the rest of his time is spent on morning routine. <laughs> no, just kidding. Yeah, no, hey, you're, I don't think you're that far off. That's awesome. Um, all right, my last one is going to be around, um, are there resources that you're using to stay up on digital marketing? I mean, maybe the book you just talked about, but or like uh, websites you go to or blogs that you go to pretty consistently just to stay up on trends, e-commerce, Kickstarter, maybe even your food world, the skillet world, right? Like what, what are you guys kind of uh, uh, absorbing? Yeah, well, I guess like for resources for for Kickstarter, which we really loved and which really helped us in um, preparing, was like Jamie's uh, Jamie Stegmeier's uh, blog. There's also a new book recently came out from the founder of Launchboom. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called so Crowdfunded. Crowdfunded. Yeah, that that was I would recommend that. Um, marketing wise, I think there's a new what was the newsletter called? Did there's new newsletter. Yeah, there's a bunch of newsletters po- uh, popping up that um, are like digesting all kinds of uh, topics or all kinds of news in, in a specific niche or, or on a topic. So we yeah. just subscribe to this new uh, D2C newsletter. Which, it's, called new, it's just called D2C newsletter. Yeah. Really, really good insights into Facebook marketing for, for new and upcoming brands. And like, yeah. not, just, not just the marketing side, because like, as we had a marketing background, like we really need to get into like the financial parts of of Kickstarter and like right. especially um, yeah that's yeah financial planning and and these sorts of things so yeah, yeah medium medium for me some of the yeah uh, medium's great there's always yeah, stuff like, I need to find books and it's sometimes takes quite a while until like new knowledge comes into the books but medium is, is amazing for that kind of stuff I would say yeah I agree I agree well where should we send people you know where should they go outside of the Kickstarter how do they get in your guys's universe and world and start checking out what you guys are working on um, so our website is stored that's stur cookware.com so uh, they can go there and check out our crowdfunding campaign or um, by the time they listen to it maybe uh, our indieGogo in demand campaign which we plan on la- launching afterwards. They can join our newsletter or follow us on Instagram at store cookware. Yeah, that's these are the most important <laughs> channels, I would awesome. say. Awesome. 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 Well, we will definitely try to send everybody those ways. Gentlemen, great campaign, awesome product. Uh, I'm probably going to go back this right now here because, you know, I could use a good skillet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could always use a good skillet. You guys convinced me. So, uh, but uh, awesome, awesome stuff, man. And I look forward to seeing what you guys come come out with in the future here. I mean, I think you guys are doing an amazing job and great storytelling, great Kickstarter campaign. And uh, I was really excited to chat. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Thanks Jeff. a lot for having us. No problem. Thanks, guys. Have a great one. Bye-bye. <laughs>